I do believe I've inadvertently stumbled upon the cure-all for crafter's block. And this is showing no signs of letting up because I am having way too much fun with it. I'm five videos in and I've only drawn from like two or three screens in the entire game series. Hello everyone, Wylock here. Welcome back and today we will continue to draw inspiration from the first two Baldur's Gate games. Focusing on the mundane to come up with something that's a little closer to spectacular. Uh, real quick, before we dive in, I've mostly been doing city assets in this subseries, but is there anything you'd want to see in the next one? I'm thinking maybe like Firecrag's lair entrance, or one of those lodge-type cabins you tend to find out in the wilderness. Maybe the Druid Grove from the Windspear Hills. I don't know, I have like 10 years worth of material to mine just doing city and village-type stuff, so... Can't make any promises, but if you have a suggestion, feel free to leave a comment. Let's dive into the video. And remember that our sponsor is Heroes Horde for you 3D printers out there. Excellent selection, including all True Tiles lines. This particular tent has always stuck out in my memory through the years, so I built it. Behold! The Humble Plastic Frisbee. It's sturdy and it's pretty much the perfect size for this large tent top. Also lying around, I happen to find this clock, which fits under the frisbee just perfectly, and it even has that bulging shape down to the ground. This is going to be absolutely perfect. Don't touch that clock. What? That's what? my clock. I need that clock. Uh, I have plans for it. Okay, so I can't use the clock. I guess it needs to go continue its valuable work of hiding underneath a desk for another 14 months. I heard that. Okay, okay, so moving on, we're going to douse this frisbee with white glue. Completely coat it. Nice thick coat, almost can't see the blue. From here I made it up as I went along. I started with some paper towel, because it's pretty durable even when it gets soaked. And at all times here I maintained a vat of watered down white glue, or it might have been water and Mod Podge, I can't remember. It doesn't really matter. But I got this thing soaked. Then I wasn't happy with the texture, so I switched to toilet paper, thinking I could arrange pieces in a crosshatch pattern to get those 12 different directions that it has demarcated on the roof, but this didn't work either. And I should have known this would happen. It turned to mush. I tried to texture that mush with a paintbrush, but all it did was tear and bunch up and start to look really, really terrible. So my last ditch attempt before giving up on the project entirely was, take some of that durable paper towel, dredge it through my watered down white glue mixture, and then watch what I'm doing here. I bunch up one end and cinch it all together and keep the other end opened so it becomes a tapered triangle. The bunched end gets pinned in the center and the rest is wrapped around the outside. Now as for width, I had to sort of eyeball here and estimate how big 1 12th of the circumference was. So I was not nearly as scientific with this as I usually like to be, but as it turns out, it was really fun. My hands got really dirty doing this, and it took like three days for this thing to dry. And it still doesn't look like the source image as far as texture goes, but it does look like thick, heavy cloth has been pulled over something to form the dome of this traveling tent. And so I'm going to claim artistic license a little bit on this one, even though we're trying to reproduce things without compromise. Junk bin, to the junk bin, what's in the junk bin today? A funnel, a funnel is in the junk bin today. I just need to cut off this straight part and this will be good for that cap that's on the tent, uh, this thing here. And for the little small cap above it, I used a ping pong ball and cut that in half. Once again, paper towel dredged in that mixture and laid over top of this, pulled taut, tucked underneath that funnel. And while it was still wet, I went ahead and attached a cardstock band around the ping pong ball portion. That's this part right here. I did that while this was all wet. With the clock out of commission, I noticed this. This is a circular offcut from some project I did long ago. I don't know what it was, but this has been sitting here about five years because it's a beautiful circle and I didn't want to get rid of it. Well, it's time has come. Its height is perfect. So I'm just going to throw it on my homemade circle cutting jig on the Prox and Hot Wire table and move the wire carrier down the arm so that I can taper this entire cylinder. Cool. And again, consulting the source image, it looks like there are small pelts of various colors that form all the surfaces. They've been attached and stitched together in a haphazard manner. So I took more paper towel and chopped it up into irregular shapes, all trapezoids and irregular rectangles and stuff like that. These I dredged through my mixture and attached in a haphazard manner. Easy. It's actually the easiest thing I did in this whole video. And this dried in about six hours because it's really pretty thin. 
Here's all the colors I used, just trying to guesstimate based on looking at the source image. And my hope was that with a very watery brush, it would mix on the piece and I'd get a splotchy result, just like all those splotchy pelts you see in the image. And that is what I got, but uh, I think it's the textures being there or not being able to get right up to the borders, or maybe it's just the color selection itself was a bit off, but this doesn't quite look the part. I mean, I've gotten worse results on stuff before, but maybe there's something I can do with this later. So I moved on. Finally time to paint the roof. I picked out again three colors that I thought would match. And again, I had to freehand eyeball estimate what a 12th slice would be. At the same time, trying to make sure that the edges are where there's like a fold or even an edge of one of those pieces of paper towel from before. But ultimately, I really didn't need to think about it. The whole thing is pretty imposing visually and ended up looking okay. This green was not right. I ended up painting over this green with a more minty green later on. It's just a sky blue and a mint green mixed together 50-50 to match that little bulb in the top of the whatever, crenellation, the tower piece, I don't know what it's called. And here is that roof cap pre-staged, as well as a sheet of hemispherical beads from the dollar store that I've already spray primed. These I attached with super glue, eight of them symmetrically around the larger ring. Then all that gets painted with Army Painter Bright Gold. Man, I'm saying this, not sponsored this week. Army Painter Metallics are just the best. And then it was a matter of hot gluing everything together. And I did use hot glue, making sure all these circular connections were centered both by feel and sight. The blankets that form the walls still don't quite look right to me, but I'm not sure if there's anything more to be done with them at this point. So let's set this aside, get to the next project. Get a look at this water garden. At least I think it's a water garden. I don't know what it is. It's trapezoidal shaped, and it's got some tall pools of water in there with walkways in between. Let's make it. This is graphics medium chipboard. It's the brownish grayish stuff you find at the back of a legal pad, but you can buy it in bulk if you want like I do. There's links in the video description below. Anyway, we're gonna take this and some foam board. This is from Dollar Tree. The paper peels off of it easily, but if you can't find this brand, soak it in water and the paper will peel off. Anyway, I'm gonna bind these two substrates together with some white PVA glue evenly spread out. And after about a half hour that set and I cut out the trapezoidal shape, then I went about making the floor texture, which appears to be just a whole bunch of small rectangles, not in a staggered offset or subway pattern. So this is nothing more than the classic, lightly pre-score with a utility knife and then widen with a mechanical pencil. Now look at these posts at the four corners of the garden where the walls meet. And then I remembered that in my wood bits I had a bunch of old school clothes pins. These will work nicely, they just need to be shortened a little bit, and then those slots covered up with some cardstock. Now I want the walls to be very sturdy, very durable, and that means using a cardboard substrate as opposed to pure foam. So I'm once again using graphics medium chipboard. I settled on a wall height of two inches, and these go from post to post. I bricked them up exactly as described in a previous video, so I won't reiterate that here. I'll throw a card on the screen. You can watch it if you want to. And for the little pools themselves, here is a Gatorade cap and some more cardstock. That makes the center circular well. The rest are simply double corrugated cardboard bases with more cardstock glued on the side as thinner walls. Those get brickified too. Now all the stonework in this thing is definitely brownish, it's not gray, so I tried out a different color scheme. First a good base coat with burnt umber, then I dry brushed with khaki, pretty heavily. There shouldn't be too much burnt umber still showing through. I already know I'm headed for sort of a bland result here, but when doing these Baldur's Gate builds, that's sort of a blessing in disguise. A lot of the game's textures and environments are kind of bland and blotchy. I don't know what I was thinking here, but I used my usual black wash, just water and black paint, but this had the effect of turning the whole thing just boring gray. Did not work. So I rebased and then re-dry brushed, and this time I dry brushed with a little bit more of a creamy color. Then for the wash, I used an oil paint instead of water and acrylic. This is plain old brown oil paint from the tube into some thinner. You can find it at any crafting supply store. And again, I've covered this in a previous video, but I will say these oil washes have changed my life. 
A lot of my contemporaries discovered it long ago, and I finally gave it a try. And I'm kicking myself that I waited so long, because the end result is so much more colorful than with acrylics. It's also got a lot more working time. And unlike acrylics, it dries pretty much what you see is what you get. The shine goes away because it stops being wet, but as far as concentrations and color density, what you see is what you get. So yeah, I experimented with a few colors. I ended up not using that battleship gray, but deco art khaki tan and apple barrel light mocha. The overbrush with that khaki tan is very strong so as to pretty much obscure the burnt umber. And the light mocha is a much more deft touch. It's a bit more selective. I just watch what I'm doing here, sort of picking at it, making sure there's not a lot of paint on the brush, coming in from different directions and different angles. And by doing that, this wall already looks great with basically zero effort. I mean, whatever, one or two minutes of effort. We've already got three shades going on, and the bricks that are thinner and more recessed, naturally the brush didn't get to them, so they look darker like they're supposed to. And once again, that brown wash is just gorgeous. Brought these to life, made them look like the source image. At this point, I was psyched. And about, I don't know, hour, two hours later, which is a downside, the oil does take longer to dry, but once it was, I was ready to assemble. What little warp was remaining in the floor, I knew would be counteracted by these walls being attached because I'm gonna have two axes of control, and I just attached them with hot glue. As you can see, I left off the bottom row of bricks on them as the connection point. I also left the walls slightly short because I know that those clothes pins are gonna go at the corners later. Those are also mounted with simple hot glue. I also painted them first so that it wouldn't be finicky to get in there and risk getting any of that bluish paint on my beautiful walls and floor. And now it is time for a resin pour. I am still on the same two containers of Art & Glow two-part epoxy that I bought years and years ago. With any of these clear two-part epoxies, the trick is going to be to stir very thoroughly, as thoroughly as you think possible, and then do it another minute. If you don't have proper mixing, it will cure sticky. And that is the worst. Now normally you shouldn't do this. Water is not blue, but in this game, well, it is. So I added some blue ink. And this was a bit too blue, it was a bit too much. So I added some teal ink to tamp it down a little bit. Maybe I should have used just teal ink to begin with, but whatever, this is gonna look fine. And then comes the resin. I was careful laying them out and dry fitting them before gluing them down. It's tight in there and I really want to make sure that a one inch base miniature can fit in as many places as possible. I already know I kind of messed up and should have made this whole room an inch bigger in each direction. That would have solved the problem, but that's alright. So after I had my arrangement, these are attached simply with hot glue. Oh, what else do we see strewn about the city? Oh, look at these things. You tend to see these all over. I'm not sure exactly what they are. Storage stands of some sort with like an awning. So I built some of those. And I'm not gonna belabor this. I have nine years of videos now intermittently doing stuff with wood products. The only thing a little bit new here is this drywall mesh. You lay this in amongst the drywall mud where two panels meet when you're like building a house. But it makes fine material for terrain crafting. This is what I'm using for the roofs of those see-through awnings. In short, coffee stir sticks are the go-to, and an assorted pack of wooden dowels, including square-shaped wooden dowels from the craft store, is good to have on hand. And this is just a case of miniature carpentry. You see me using some hot glue here to attach these together? Don't do this. I learned later on when I use that brown oil wash that it seeps under the hot glue into the wood and the whole thing falls apart to literal mush. I lost one of these and had to rebuild it completely. Use super glue or white PVA glue if you're patient, but I like to use super glue with a bit of accelerant so I can move right along in the same night and build the whole thing in one shot. Now, what do we see on here? We see, it looks like some exotic colored cushions or something like bed cushions and then a few jars. Well, for the cushions, I kept it easy. Back to my foam board, just freehand cutting some strips, peeling the paper from both sides, and then chopping down to appropriate size looking rectangles. Then I squeezed them to distress them and sort of break down the shape a little bit. And then this does not need to be difficult. Base coat them, 
freehand a darker version of that color to make some lines, wash it down, and then re-brighten the edges with that same base coat. Except for the blue ones. Their edges are tan for some reason. I'm glad I caught that when I did. I wouldn't have been able to sleep for the rest of my life. So those are done, and I've done jars and bottles and potions and stuff before on the channel. But just a quick rehash, I've been continually harvesting from an old DVD player. Miniature capacitors and resistors make great jars and bottles and stuff like that. Just take some Toho seed beads that you can find at any crafting supply store and attach it to a resistor with some super glue. When you cut the resistor free, leave a little bit of its leg for the bead to grab onto. Depending how steady-handed you are and willing to do some surgery, you can find some of the really tiny components. Like these resistors, these are basically true scale potions for a 28 millimeter miniature human. But man, they are finicky to work with and paint. Not fun. Anyway, I glued on those cushions and bottles in the same arrangement as you can see in the source image. What do you think? Did I nail it or not? Leave a comment. Now, I've said it before and I will say it again. When it comes to this miniatures crafting hobby stuff, there's just no substitute for real wood products. They're easier, they're way stronger, and they look more natural than any other substance you tried to texture up. They also suck in paint and dry almost instantly. So if you usually do all your timbers and boards by texturing up foam, you owe it to yourself to experiment with a different material and see if maybe it ends up working for you. That's what happened to me. And hey, if you're in the mood for a medium quality D&D one-shot, I've published three of them. Just check out my Etsy link in the video description below. They are priced accordingly. I'm also on Patreon, but maybe not for very much longer. It's kind of a negligible revenue stream compared to everything else. Honestly, I'd forego any other kind of support besides just clicking subscribe and like and reminder bell. So please do. Well now, I have to say that was a very fun time in the crafting shop today. If this is your first exposure to me, know that I have hundreds of videos in my backlog. Also find us on Facebook, the Tabletop Crafters Guild. Over 40,000 members making miniature stuff for their tabletop gaming just like this. Until next time, I'm Wylock. Make things, play games.